Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great show for you tonight. Our guest is Jorge Cervantes, the legendary author of dozens of cannabis books, including Marijuana Horticulture uh, and the Cannabis Encyclopedia. So Jorge's been translated into over a dozen languages and uh, we'll be talking with him here shortly. But as always, we're going to bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Okay, so we're back and we've got Jorge Cervantes as our guest tonight. Jorge is from right here in Oregon. And we uh, uh, want to remind you that if you are a loved one, are uh, looking for help finding a doctor who can help you qualify for a medical marijuana permit anywhere in the United States, then give us a call. Our number is 503-235-4606. It's 503-235-4606. Zero six. Also, I am going to Mexico. I'll be off to Mexico tomorrow. I'll be going to uh, Puebla, Mexico and Mexico City. We'll be talking more in the coming week about that. I'm going to uh, record out on the road. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and also uh, their upcoming week on 420, Wednesday 420. There will be the Nikki Dank 420 party. Uh, you can check online for more information about that. And uh, again, if you need to reach out, just, just call us at 503-235-4606. So here is our interview with Jorge Cervantes. Uh, stay, keep watching and remember to work to restore hemp. Good night. Well, I would like to welcome back to our show a good friend of mine I've known about 35 years now. Welcome back, Jorge Cervantes. How are you, sir? Really good, Paul. Really good. I'm really excited. Uh, nice to be here. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm talking to you from Bar um, Barcelona, Spain. I've been here for the last almost three years now since I've been out. Um, uh -huh. Traveled around here a little bit, but COVID's kind of like slowed things down. I remember back when... George W. Bush or, or Bush Jr. first was elected and you took me out to breakfast here in Portland and said, I just can't stay here any longer. I'm moving to Spain. And you've been there most of the time since then. Uh, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I've traveled, traveled quite a bit. And yeah, exactly. That was. Whew. Yeah, I've been here for a couple of decades, really. Uh, it's just America's so hard sometimes, you know? It's like there's a bunch of violence and, and things, and I don't know, I, I just get on better here. Always have. It's um, a good place. I know your wife, likes, your wife likes it there too, so that always helps. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good, you know? I mean, uh, we both integrated like 20 years ago. So it's, we don't just hang out with Americans or people that talk our language. We can both talk Spanish uh, quite well. Uh, we don't talk the local language, uh, Catalan, but we can both read it pretty well and understand it pretty well, you know. I mean, well, about 80, you can read about 80% fast, you know, and then after that, you got to look up words uh, or slow down a little bit and think a little, and you can get about 90, 95% then, and then you got to look I up your words. Most of our audience doesn't realize that Spain is kind of an amalgam of a five different lingual groups and the part of Spain you're in is Catalan and so the people's first language there 
It's Catalan. Yes. Where <laughs> Spanish, we know the old uh, Leon and uh, no Castilla La Mancha. It was it was the old uh, Spanish started in Madrid and it was Castilla and Leon, the area just northwest of Madrid. And then they started expanding. But there's on the there's Catalonia or Cata, uh, Catalonia, which is the Barcelona area. It's a big province. Above that, or on the Atlantic coast, uh, and the bordered by the Pyrenees, is uh, uh, Pais Vasco, uh, the Basque country, and they talk a, a completely different language. And then on the Cantabrico, the the northern sea there, the is the uh, uh, Ast Asturias. Asturias. Asturias is surrounded by mountains and it's never been conquered. In fact, uh, there was a big, I think it was about 12th, 13th century, uh, some uh, Scottish explorers that made a colony there. And the bagpipes and bagpipes are big over there. Yeah, you'd never guess that. And then to the left of that is Galicia. That's where Franco came from, the dictator that was dictator here 37 years. And, and funny, funny, but uh, there was this guy that was the governor there. What was his name? Um, oh, uh, Fraga, Fraga. And he, uh, yeah, Fraga. And uh, that's where all the drugs came in through Galicia. That was the big drug port from South America because all of the Mediterranean was pretty well covered. Yeah. So that's kind of funny. And then, yeah, so those those are the languages. And then obviously there's Spanish and that's spoken all in Andalusia and stuff. I see. I see. So you're about to come out with a new book. You want to tell our new book? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, actually pretty interesting. I had, uh, let me see if I've got any, well, let's see, this is my last book here, the uh, Cannabis, I, can, I don't know, the like, Sinful Cat. A little out of focus, but we'll get a picture of it and put it up. Okay, okay, yeah, and then the other one too, I just don't, oh, here it is. This one here, it's got a light bulb on it. That, that goes in focus, the text doesn't seem to focus so quickly. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's this book here that I'm uh, updating, Marijuana Horticulture, the AKA the Bible, because it hasn't been updated for years and years and years. So during COVID, I decided to update it and wrote for a couple of years, seriously, wrote and researched and everything. I couldn't leave much. I could make phone calls and, and send messages and receive messages. But what I found was uh, there's just a hell of a lot of information, more information than before. And things have changed substantially uh, since this book was updated. And then I started figuring out the price of uh, printing it and looking at transport costs and all of that stuff has changed. So it's just too expensive to make a paper book. And um, so what I decided to do is make a book and uh, put it online and make a subscription service. And that turned out to be way cooler than I thought, because what I can do is add to the book. And in that way, it makes it a lot better because you can add in specific areas about specific subjects. And what you find in the current media is there's an article that will focus on a simple su or what specific subject and there's quite a bit of information but you've got to decipher all of this stuff and control let's see or yeah control all of these articles or have access to all of these articles and take your own notes so it turns into a lot of work you know you can find a lot of good information but with a book like this you can search it and if there's something new we can put it in so that makes it really uh, a valuable tool because the main thing it does is it, it's got everything there and it saves time and energy and you know things will be correct so well, that's what i've been saying for many years when i first was learning how to grow marijuana myself in the the mid 1980s 84 85 I uh, picked up your book 
And I found your book was the most helpful. And, you know, in opening my clinics and helping literally a couple hundred thousand patients become medical marijuana, I would always recommend your book with the uh, comment that anything you need to do, you just look it up. And if you want to make cuttings, there's a little bit on cuttings. If you're looking for your lights, there's, a, a you know, 15, 20 pages on cuttings. So you can quickly read the information you need right then. Yeah. And so I always, uh, I, I think I told you way back then, and I think it's on the cover now that it was my Bible through my uh, learning process there in the, the 19 or mid 1980s. Yeah, that, yo, oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad it helped. You know, I mean, it's a good deal. Uh, the, the, the thing is, you, I don't know if you, you can't really see the word Bible here. There it yeah. is, Bible. But uh, it, this book won the name. It won the name. It, it earned the name. It didn't. I just didn't write it down. You know, it won that name. Yeah, it did. Uh, so I could put it down honestly. Say this. This is what everybody else calls it. Therefore, I can call it that name. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. That's pretty cool. But yeah, yeah. I'm I'm pretty excited about this because I can add stuff. I, I can make uh, in, incredibly good searches. We we can make uh, drop down menus. You know. So it'll be really quick and easy to search because right now there's quite a bit of good information on the Internet, but so much of it's sales oriented, yeah. you know, and when you get down to like scientific stuff and things that are just beyond most people's knowledge level or comfort zone, uh, it's easy to, to, to bullshit them, to tell them, you know, direct send them one way instead of the other and so it's, it's really important to stay with the facts and stay with hard science because then you can prove everything and it, it works pretty well and your encyclopedia is does the same thing but it's just a lot more in depth and detailed i think well yeah the thing is about this so the book's too damn big it's uh, <laughs> you know it's got a lot of information but it's just it's too big it's it, 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 it would have been cool 10 years ago before the internet was here, uh, real strong, but it's it's got a lot of information, it's easy to access, but it weighs too much and it's too cumbersome. What I need is something that works on somebody's cell phone, and I got I can't find my damn phone. I, let, I, I put my phone up somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, anyway, uh, so this, it'll be all formatted for the phone, for the tablet, for the uh, uh, for the laptop, and big screen, too. Uh, for IBM, or I mean for DOS, not DOS, but uh, Microsoft and uh, Apple formats. How many books have you put out to date? <laughs> you know, that's really weird, because uh, now I have a partner, the, a, a digital guy that can... Who knows how to do this stuff? I have no clue. Uh, but the deal is he can, um, uh, he told me to figure that out the other day. And I never really thought about it. I did like light counts and stuff, but I really dug through. I've done uh, like 46 books, if you count all the languages, you know. Yeah. And I've done, uh, well, here, I don't know. Can you see, can you see Russian? This is in Russian. Yeah, yeah that looks Russian to me. Yeah, <laughs> it, We're gonna have to, it, it takes it takes a while for that to focus, but yeah, this is here we go. Okay, that's focusing, but the other part, I don't know. Oh, here we go. You can see the but now. yeah. We're gonna have this time some we're... sanctions on that, though. You know. Uh, oh man, no, my friend, my publisher, his he lives. Uh, he had to move to Praga to you know Czech Republic. And then uh, what his and he was really concerned at the Spanabis. He was like about ready to go nuts. His sister's over in Ukraine with two kids, right? Oh no! Yeah, yeah, that Russian. And he says this all this Putin stuff is BS. That uh, says they don't have bad relations. Everything's cool. He's just this Putin guy. Yeah. So uh, anyway, they uh, during the fair they were over there hiding in a basement and stuff. Uh, now they're on the move, but we, it's a, a it's Ukra ugly. We had a Ukrainian guy who builds hemp houses, Sergei Kalenkakov. He was on our show a few weeks ago, and then 
I ran into him at the, they flew him in and gave him an award at the NOCO hip conference, which is the biggest industrial hip conference in America. And right. so that was just a couple of weeks ago. But um, we interviewed him on the show about, I don't know, six weeks ago, just a week into the war there. But uh, pretty horrible. Yeah, I've got an interview lined up with somebody in, in Ukraine, but I'm not exactly sure who it is. I don't know. I don't know where they live and stuff. Uh, geography plays a big part. But, damn, that's got to be affecting everybody. Because, you know, I mean, Germany, those guys are uh, pretty nervous right now. They're building up a military. Uh, yeah, first time. You know, same, uh, same with uh, Poland, too, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's about... You've been in Europe for so long, and we, they just had what most Americans probably haven't heard of, what is now the biggest cannabis conference in Europe, I believe, Spanibus. And I know you got to spend right. a couple of days at Spanibus. Tell our audience about Spanibus and other kind of cannabis conferences in Oh, Europe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Actually, the next one's going to be uh, uh, Canatrade. Uh, and now... Uh, Canatrade is in Switzerland. This year it's in uh, Bern. And uh, it, it's great. It was like one of the original fairs. And this was back like 1998 to about 2002. It was killer. I mean, in Switzerland back then, you could, cannabis didn't turn into a drug until you rolled it up into a joint and actually put fire to it, right? right? They stole, so they it was not it, bags or scent bags, kind of like yeah, yeah. It was like alfalfa. It'd be like alfalfa hay until it comes to that point, and then they started uh, the smelling bags and uh, and uh, yeah, smelling bags and aroma pillows for sleeping didn't come until afterwards. They went through a whole thing, but they were growing fields and fields of cannabis. I mean, it was, they were exporting to everybody. I, it was amazing. And that happened for about six With years. Strong. Face oh. there, way back when. Uh, oh, call. yeah, 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 yeah. I went, yeah, he, he, yeah, they have what they call legal problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, he. I, I was over there actually. I went over to visit him, and he had I don't know maybe five and a half, six, maybe I don't know. It, 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 he had a hell of a lot of dope growing. And it was, I can't remember if it was hectares or acres or acres, you know, if, or it was hectares, but it, it's uh, 12 seems to ring a bell, you know, uh, but he had quite a bit, uh, quite a bit there. Yeah, see, it's hard to find seeds. It was hard to find enough seeds back then to plant that much. And you pretty much had to plant that much in, in, uh, well, with seeds, because remember in the oh uh, the German part there, right on the border with the French, there was Cannabio land, and when yeah. when yeah. he first got there, Iverson made like sixty thousand clones, and with that he rented half a hectare, which is <clears throat> a little bit more than an acre, and so I went and helped him harvest in, I guess it was ninety eight. Or 99, yeah, 98 it was definitely 98. Yeah, this was like 99. He had moved some, he'd moved more interior. It was more deeper in there. And there was just a lot when I was there. I mean, like I can't say, I can't remember uh, how much, but it was just everywhere. It was a huge field back there. Yeah, it seemed like it was 12 acres or, yeah, I mean, because you could walk for like 10 minutes in one direction and, still be in the same field you remember uh he was putting together a movie you remember that the green goddess the green the goddess. goddess and it had mila's in it soma's in it he recorded a little bit with me in it well we finally just got a distributor summerhill films so <laughs> like a three decade product or project yeah this uh 20 year old movie will finally hopefully get onto some streaming service this year we'll see cool cool or you can put it on youtube too i mean there's youtube yeah. has everything 
Tell yeah, so so it's been pretty exciting. Um, actually, just recently, I just came back from uh, Almeria. Uh, Almeria or Almeria is uh, in South Spain, and you know Spain is a peninsula like this, Iberian Peninsula, and there's a part that's protected on both sides by uh, little points of land that go down, and then under that is uh, it's like the best climate in continental Europe, absolute best, and it's totally protected. It's uh, right next to the the Mediterranean Sea, so the water, or I mean, the, the weather's moderated. It's always got a, a breeze because of the geola geographic location. Yeah. Is that like Valencia or? Uh... South, of, uh, south of Valencia. Okay. And south of uh, Valicante, it's uh, Almeria. A L M E R I A. Mm -hmm. It's where the, uh, the it's the greenhouse capital of Europe. Okay. And it's where they grow most of the well greenhouse vegetables. But it, it's pretty amazing. They're growing everything from mangoes, mango trees. They're a little bit smaller. They're developed for for this area, or I mean for that area down there. It's a little warmer than where I'm at in uh, Barcelona. And they also grow avocados and bananas. Bananas more grow in the, the Canary Islands, but under under a greenhouse. And and then also all of the other uh, greenhouse vegetables, tomatoes, um, uh, well, eggplants. Eggplants are really big here, actually. Uh, cucumbers, peppers. And it, but it's all concentrated there. And it's like 60, 70 percent of the peppers and, and uh, tomatoes are grown for all of Europe are grown right there in a small area. So you know, that uh, if we go back to the 80s and 90s, we'd have to say that Holland or the Netherlands was the center of cannabis cultivation in Europe. It switched there in the late 90s and early 2000s to Switzerland, but everything pretty much moved to Spain. Yes. After all yes. of the major seed companies and in Europe the seed companies dominate the market don't they oh definitely definitely um it's it's funny because uh you know the reason I mentioned that is because I'm I'm down there companies want to go into cannabis now they're interested that's I can't talk about what I was doing but they're big companies they're really interested you know and uh, now the two strong biggest places for growing are what well, used to be Granada, which is in the south. That's up in the mountains. That's I don't know. Uh, it used to be the last Arab stronghold here. That's where the Alhambra is. But that whole area is full of like mountains and well, rolling hills and whatnot. A lot of little towns. So that's a huge growing area. And so is around here, uh, Catalonia all of Catalonia, but now the cops are, you know, they're taking it more seriously and stuff. Um, period where they allow social clubs there. I know when I first came there about 2013 and 2014, I went to Expo Grow up in the back. They were allowing these clubs to serve right. like 100 people each or something like that. But recently they closed a lot of them down, haven't they? Well, yeah, I mean, it's weird. It, it goes back and forth. It's a give and take. A lot of this happened in the Netherlands, too, uh, and it still is. Uh, right now, see, I'm, I'm in a Natico apartment, and viene los, uh, the, the uh, sirens, you know, the, the ambulance comes by. And so now you have this sound. Uh, the sorry. Catalonian separatists there, right? That's uh, yeah, uh, well, it's only, it's, okay, I just read the survey yesterday in the paper, it was 48 want to, 48% want to stay uh, with Spain and 44% want to separate. It's like the dichotomy we have here in the United States between the Democrats and Republicans. It's, uh, no, it's kind of, this one, seven, this one's 700 years old. These guys are like serious. Uh, you know, and they've been shooting bullets about it. Well, they had they shot bullets in America too, but yeah, here it's just a little more recent. They have a civil war, right? So about the seed companies, do you want to talk about how the seed companies operate there? I know here in America yeah. we really don't have that. 
kind of the the biggest players have been the media companies kind of what do you think about the difference between the european cannabis scene and the american cannabis scene oh it's substantially different once i mean there's just a lot more dope in america because it's legal uh that you can grow a lot more and especially in the west coast there's like way more and here it's still a pretty precious commodity um because it's well it's it's tolerated but not legal here in spain for example you can grow at home in catalonia <clears throat> but you can't you're not supposed to be able to see it from the street and you're not supposed to have over four plants and four plants is kind of a relatively relative number the big deal is they don't want to make uh you can't have commerce but with the social clubs uh the deal is where do they get their cannabis they're supposed, they set it up, but it's not enforced. You're supposed to have a membership base that grows it, and you're supposed to be, be able to support that membership base with cannabis and do a group thing. But all of the laws aren't in place for all of that stuff. So there's this illicit market. And then right now, in fact, the last three or f- three months, four months has been happening. The, the police, it's the police comes through with the uh, building inspector. And there's two different agencies represented, uh, uh, law enforcement and uh, building code enforcement. And so they'll go in and to a, a club and say, it's like, okay, how much how much uh, cannabis do you have on hand? And you're only supposed to have here, you're only supposed to have 600 grams. Well, 600 grams is not even a busy morning sometimes, you know? I mean, you can move right through that. So uh, it, it, uh, they, they squeeze people unreasonably because there's two agencies and nobody's really talking. There's, you know, like in America, a lot of times these people posing over here and nobody just gets down and goes face to face and says, look, guys, what's reasonable? Nobody says that. And uh, so that's what we're experiencing now. And so clubs are going through that. Um, yeah, and also there's uh, uh, investigations going on. Uh, Dina Fem's being investigated. Uh, there was a big, uh, big article about that, uh, and that, that started two years ago in September, or a year, yeah, in September, a year ago in September. So last September, it's like 18 months it's been going on, 19 months, 18 months of investigation. Well, it's since something has moved forward and nobody's, we don't know anything. So, you know, it, it can be tenuous. There's also cannabis licenses are given out here uh, for research, uh, CBD licenses. You can grow CBD here, but you've got to have uh, uh, somebody to buy it that's outside the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's people selling CBD quasi legally and nobody bothers them uh it's kind of like up in the air there's nobody's nobody's made a, a firm law and then like we defined before there's five different languages and also like five different attitudes and within each city is an attitude so it's different what we're waiting for here is for germany to legalize and they've been like really talking about it and um i haven't been following it real close but they made uh, about two months ago they they passed uh they said okay we're going to take this seriously and we're going to decide what we're going to do that means they're going to legalize it they just don't know exactly how they're studying it because when they say something like that there it's it it's for sure you know it's not tenuous or anything they don't change their mind they have a, a new government in place, a new coalition that includes the Green Party that have been yeah. advocating legalization for a long, long time. But now, hasn't Belgium and Malta leapfrogged Luxembourg. ahead? And- Luxembourg. Luxembourg went 100%. 100%. And, and Belgium, I don't know what they're going to do. they got a whole different system up there. They've got Luxembourg. this... Uh, kind of like, it's, oh, it's way different in Belgium. Those guys kind of have this community system, and it's you can you can grow there and stuff. It's not a problem, but they go yeah. It, it, does it bother the neighbors? Does it disrupt the neighborhood? So all you have to do is not wor- worry about the neighbors 
not disrupting them. So everybody just kind of stays at the same level and happy. It does. It's not like disrupted. Uh, it, I, it, yeah, because I know several people growing there, and that's what they say. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, you can grow, but don't grow too much because then it makes this traffic and the other neighbors don't like it. And But there's, it, it's really, really different, uh, pretty tolerant there. Hasn't the island of Malta also moved yes. to legalize the nation of Malta? Yeah, yeah. And Malta is kind of interesting. Um, oh, I saw a couple of stuff, uh, things. I thought about going over there, but it's not, it's a short plane trip. But uh, see, Malta, Malta got caught up in that SNL thing in 2008, and they had like real big fiscal problems. The savings and, and loan crisis. Yeah, savings and loan, exactly. And so they uh, uh, they have real big fiscal problems. And so I just don't know how the cannabis thing is going to work out. The, the island's pretty heavily populated and tourism's big there. Uh, it's it's kind of like a fiscal capital. Uh, I mean, uh, kind of like... There's a lot of foreigners living there. It's a big place for oligarchs to go uh, from Russia. Uh, yeah, because they had a deal where you could get a visa there. Uh, it was easier to get a visa there and enter Europe. Uh, they had a bunch of stuff going on, but everything kind of tells me to, I don't know, uh, they're going to have some pretty big people in there doing stuff. I got a couple of emails from people that are growing small there, but I don't know. I don't know how things are going to progress there. Uh, like I said, all that fiscal stuff from before seems to catch up, and there's stuff I don't know that other people are doing, and we so you have, never know what's going to turn out. We have had here on our show recently a fellow in the Czech Republic who publishes the magazine Legalize It. And he is oh, yeah, yeah, I know those guys. I know all the European guys. I Here's know. another one I got. Look at this. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the Czech Republic is, is big. Uh, they've got a big uh, fair over there. Actually, I've never been there. This year, I'll probably go. It's, uh, it's in November. It's in Praga or Prague. And um, yeah, I met the, met the guy that throws it. He comes to several other fairs. He's real nice, and it's a big fair. Uh, everybody seems to get on pretty well there. But yeah, there's a lot of things here. Here's a book that I got from, but this is in, this is in Spanish and, and he's, uh, he's from the Czech Republic. Yeah. 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 Oh, quick seal Cuevas. He did it with Nacho. Yeah. 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 Uh, Republica Checa. But uh, Mr. Jose, yeah, he's uh, he's really nice guy. I saw him at the at, at uh, I wish this I'm holding this so maybe it, there it goes. Yeah, there. kind of focused. Yeah, but it's, it's maybe if I turn it for the light. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's uh, really a good book or well, good. I don't know. It's it's well done. It's well done. And here's uh, Senor Jose. Yeah, I saw him there. Um, so it's really good. He's kind of like uh, one of my uh, followers, protégés, and he was real pleased to be able to give me this book and sign it. So I wanted to show it. <laughs> uh, right. Right. But there's a huge movement in uh, uh, Czech Republic because, like over there in Central Europe, those guys really never did get a drug war. They didn't know what one was because they, it, you know, they came on after the Soviet Union broke. And uh, so it was just another industrial crop for all through Central Europe. And they didn't, you know, I mean, they had so many other things to worry about. They didn't really think about cannabis. And it's kind of like an afterthought. And um, I can't remember exactly why, but there was a couple of key reasons why cannabis started so big in Czech Republic. And I just can't remember. It's been on. Legalize It magazine had something to do with it, but the fellow who's been putting that out is being prosecuted for distributing drug information or something like that. Kind of like the 
I, the uh, the Green Merchant crackdown here in America in the late 80s and early 90s. Yeah, yeah, because see, those things will come through every once in a while. It's happening up in Netherlands right now because the new mayor, uh, a woman, uh, she hates cannabis. She just hates it and does everything she can to close every door, every door for, for cannabis. It's uh, terrible. Move back. Yeah, yeah, and it happens here too. You get like one or two people in a position of power, and they start raising raising hell. It, I remember in in Switzerland when you know they were growing a lot. Remember I said before for that six year period. Yeah. And then this guy, a new governor, came into Ticino, the southern uh, uh, canton of uh, Switzerland, where they talk Italian. And uh, guy, he just started busting everybody. It was really bad, uh, and it lasted for quite a while. Uh, well, for about a year and a half, and then they then they took his budget away from him because they said it wasn't very efficient. <laughs> the things that he was doing, yeah, yeah. Another thing really wreaked havoc with everybody, and they're they're doing it here. They do it periodically. It depends on where. And that's why we need these national laws so they can't like screw with us like that. They Another can... fellow we've had on here, uh, Roar Mickelson. He's written a number of drug policy books, uh, and he has set up a little stand in front of the uh, uh, the police station in the capital of Norway to sell marijuana. Of course, they arrested him right away, but he's uh, got a constitutional case that is coming up in June. Oh, really? Might work to strike down Norway's cannabis laws. You know, Norway has been a big prohibitionist area for some they're time. They're horrible. Norway is like Norway and Sweden. Those two, you wouldn't think, but those two are horrible, horrible places. But Norway especially. Yeah. Wow. So what? he's a little stand. Uh, we had him on the show. I, I got several of his books because he'd written a number of books about human rights and the constitutional aspects of legalization. And I filed some constitutional challenges to the United States marijuana laws in my time. So uh, it was interesting. He says, like I said, there, his case he thinks will come to a resolution with some strike against Norwegian cannabis laws next in, in June. Really? That's pretty, I can see that's what, that's what Mexico did. It was yeah. a, a, a human right to use cannabis is That's what the deal was. So, and I thought, Mexico, that'll never work, you know? And <laughs> they pulled it off, man. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. It was great. Yeah, the Supreme Court of Mexico threw out the law. They gave the legislature of Mexico almost three years to change the laws, and they never could come to an agreement. And so... Uh, in October, they just threw out the possession laws in Mexico. So the police aren't used to that yet, though. They still like to shake people down for their bribes. They can't get away from that bribe money. Yeah, news doesn't. News travels slowly, and uh, to fight those guys, you gotta have the proper last name. You gotta be rich kid or rich rich person, and then you tell them that that means more than the law like what your name is you know you heard about the planton 420 movement that's going on in mexico city where they've been growing marijuana in front of the mexican senate for over two years now now they're growing it in front of the mexican supreme court and now these planton marijuana gardens are showing up in front of courts all over mexico excellent no no you know i communicate with julio sometimes i did he? No, he didn't come over to the uh, the fair. I didn't see him, but I communicate with him. Uh, but no, no, I haven't been really watching what's been going on in Mexico for for a while. I mean, I, you went to school in Mexico a long yeah, time. Yeah, I went to university there. I know Mexico well. I, you know, I do. But uh, I am going to Mexico to Puebla and Mexico City uh, in about less than two weeks. Well, I, I mean, that's where I, li I live. I live in uh, Puebla and I live in Cholula. It's like a uh, suburb. Or, or, well, right now, it's, it's uh, three mi four miles, four miles from Puebla. Yeah. 
So this and thing is, you know, my pronunciation is bad, but I'm going to try to say it. Rafaela Ganges Lara, and it's the Lara Lera. Cannabis Cup. And she so I'm going to go there uh, over the 420 holiday, and then the weekend of the oh. 20, uh, 24th and 25th, uh, they have their public uh, event. And so well, that's next week, okay. And then after that, I think the 20. Fifth and twenty sixth and seventh. I'm going to go to the Planton 420, the where they're growing the cannabis there in front of the United States Senate. There's a guy, Pepe Rivera. He's been. How do, uh, how do they get people to not pick it? To to you know. The government's been allowed. I'm going to find out more. I interviewed him once on our show about, and I've seen him when I've gone to Julio's events at Expo Weed uh, Mexico, but. Uh, I'm gonna right, go. Right. That was like three or four years ago. I was down there. Yeah, yeah, we were there. But I haven't been to Mexico to the Expo Weed. There, I've been. I saw Julio. We were hanging out in Colombia. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and he keeps asking me to come to Mexico, and I got to find a real good reason to go. But that, I went over to uh, uh, Vicente Fox's uh, thing, and oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, it's all of the. Mexico's so difficult, you know. I mean, as soon as money goes, as soon as somebody has money on the table, everybody looks at it and says, That's mine, you know, that's the biggest problem. And that's what they're all waiting for the cannabis for the money to show up on the table so they can say mine. Uh, but they're waiting that long. Um, I know Mexico, you know, it's uh, ah. You can have a lot of small growers there that might work, you know, like, uh, but nobody can have too many plants because it'll turn into um, a business that's not much fun to participate in. Right. Yeah, no, you don't want to, you don't want that kind of business. No, uh, no. They're definitely doing good work with this Planton 420. Uh, we'll, we'll find out a little bit more when I go there in person. Uh, in a few weeks, a couple of weeks. I have a couple of other gigs coming up. Oh. One in Bogota at the end of May and another one in Ecuador in uh, July. So if you want to go to... Well, hold on, hold on. Where is it going to be in Ecuador? Huh? Where, where in Ecuador? Guayaquil. Guayaquil on the coast. Pay attention to your news. What's been going on in Guayaquil, eh? <laughs> there was a big... Uh, you know, there's big riots there, pretty pretty big uh, police actions and stuff. When? Uh, uh, about a month and a half ago, five weeks. Um, I was in when they had a lot of protests, but I just saw a lot of people banging on pots. I didn't feel I was okay. in danger. Okay, you didn't see it. No, they, 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 they were shooting bullets, a bunch of bullets there. Gotcha. Yeah, that's why I mentioned it. You know, in Colombia, I mean, yeah. I mean, banging on pots isn't a big deal. And usually what happens, <coughs> pardon, in Colombia, what happens, they cut all the roads so you can't go a lot of places. It's the biggest problem. But usually you just stay home and you don't have any problems. Or, you know, or you stay in, in one area. Uh, just, just pay attention. That's all. That's all. Because well, well, Ecuador's well. Ecuador's changing now in the last few years as uh, and Guayaquil's the uh, the narco port, port you know like uh, Barranquilla is in Colombia. I see. Yeah, yeah. So but, do you have to come to America anytime soon? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm going to come there this summer in August. I've got my class reunion in Ontario, Oregon. Yeah. I'm going to go to that. Five oh fifty years. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> fifty years, and uh, yeah, I haven't been there. I'd like to see family. I haven't been there for three years, so uh, that'll be fun uh, to see everybody, see all the family and and friends and things. And I've got a ton of stuff to do. I've got some uh, tours to go on. I got uh, friends over here. We're lining stuff up and around the Bay Area. I don't know, they're in charge of that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a lot of what I'm into is uh, research facilities these days. 
because there's just so much cool stuff around, you know. Uh, I got this. Here's oh oh yeah. Let me tell you, uh, trade fairs. There's uh, span. Uh, I told you about uh, Canada Trade. That's gonna be uh, in May, May twentieth. Ah, uh, I'll May be 20th. in uh, Colombia then. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 May twentieth. Switzerland's a good time. They got. There's always. It's a different place completely because everybody's so efficient. And cannabis has been very big there for many years. I don't know how many people realize that. And Uber burn, of course. Uh, pardon? I love burn and I and uh, Uber burn, the, the upper lands near to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uber burn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the geography is fascinating there. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, de in different regions, and you know, they talk four languages. It's pretty neat. Okay, so this is what I saw. Oh shit, you can't hear. Okay, it was on my Facebook, but this tube, this is a Bluetooth. Ah. You can't get this in America yet. It's not registered. Oh shit, it just doesn't. So enzymes. No, what these are are uh yeah yeah the the uh, uh mycorrhizae mycorrhiza uh, fungi, but yeah. they they suspended it in a gel. And so what that does is it keeps it alive. And because usually this stuff dies by the time you put it on your plants or the soil for, for the roots, it dies. It's been hard to keep alive. So this keeps it alive and you can put it on. And normally it takes about a month to colonize roots. Well, this will colonize roots in two weeks, and yeah, so and it grows fast as hell uh, because it's in a like a well, it's a, the it's, gel, it's kind of like a auger solution that makes it grow. It, it works really good, uh, but like I say, it's not on the market yet. Uh, there's all kinds of new stuff that's that's coming out, and I'm looking now down to the Ameria, where all of the greenhouses are, and said, well, what are you guys doing? You know, I mean, where, where are you going to go except the best place? I have the right. best place in Europe. Uh, it's a few hours away, but I can go there. I have friends, uh, <laughs> good friends now. <laughs> it's a good thing. So, uh, yeah, this is this. these are some of the things that are, are happening, and there's a lot more plant-based uh, research that's going on. Because uh, everything's turning from chemical to organic, um, and uh, with new like supercomputers and uh, and new scientific methods, or well, not new. It's just everything's faster. That's and the, the whole concept of regenerative agriculture. Yes. is coming to the forefront. Where yes. for so yes. long we've been abusing the soil and the microbes yeah. and. Uh, Using up that precious asset, and then with regenerative agriculture, it's about building it back up every year instead of breaking it down. That's right. That's right. Using it for something other than to hold your chemicals, you know. Uh, you, you, but here's the deal. Now, and, and what the cool part is, it's gotten inexpensive to apply sophisticated uh, uh, analysis. So. That makes it really worthwhile. It's uh, cost effective, and there's been kind of like this tipping point. And in the business, that point has to be reached before any of those guys will pay attention. And now they're paying attention. You just can't say, well, you're going to run out of this. And because always the answer is, well, yeah, we haven't run out yet. You know, but this, they go, it makes more sense to go this way now than that way financially. And so that's what's brought really the true reason that's brought up all of this kind of stuff. What, yeah, other, but, what other big breakthroughs can you tell our audience about? We're down to a little less than 10 minutes to go here. So okay. uh, big breakthroughs. Uh, well, this this is big. The, the place that I went, I went to a place called uh, Mavi M.A. AVI in, uh, well, right in the heart of uh, Almeria. I mean, all of the big research companies are there. I mean, Colpert's there, the the insect company, you know, for for biological controls. Um, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. 
But yeah, I mean, see, that area, if you just dump chemicals in the ground all the time, uh, it wouldn't work. So they've got, it's so intense that they've got to, they've got to start there to regenerate. And then also they're using way less water. That's another, um, well, it's a huge deal how water is used and reused and what happens on, you know, during the entire process. Uh, other huge things, boy, I don't know. Um, lights, the LED lights are huge. Uh, there's, it's just like black and white. Nobody wants a HID light anymore at all. Uh, they're just not as good, uh, straight up. Uh, even the ceramic, uh, ceramic metal halides and and the the blue, bluish or color corrected uh, HP sodiums. They're just not as efficient. They produce too much heat. Yeah, the heat is always a problem. Yeah, but you know, one of the interesting things is people change from a, a HID light, could be sodium or halide, doesn't matter. The thing is, but they, they generate a lot of heat and they've got, yeah, a lot of heat and they've got a certain spectrum. But people have then take a, a LED lamp or, or a fixture, basically, and uh, put it in the same place to take over the HID's uh, place. But the group, the grow room usually runs a bit cooler, and which is a good thing, but everybody's used to running a little bit hotter in their grow room. So what happens is their whole mindset and, and uh, system is set up to run a few degrees hotter when it doesn't work that way, it doesn't need that. So your fertilizer and water uh, ratios can change. And so it's a bit, uh, for fine tuning, it's it's a little bit of a trick when you make uh, one change to another, because it's not as simple as just changing the fixture. The mind and the, the grow technique has to, has to also keep up with that, uh, which I found pretty interesting, you know, because well, that's what happens. Yeah. Well, things are moving forward. You got to admit that uh, when we both first got into this back 40 years ago or so, <laughs> things have changed enormously, haven't they? Oh, my God. Yes. I mean, uh, we had black and white printing back then, number one. Yeah. Uh, and nobody knew the difference. To, you but, couldn't tell a male from a female plant until way later. <laughs> yeah. was, the that was the biggest thing and oh gosh yeah and, and the knowledge level the the words that are common um but i remember they used to call th or hydrophonics hydrophonics at least people say hydroponics now what was that? i remember back then we had like five cannabinoids now there's like 150. right right the only testing that that was done was forensic by the police you know that was it that was the only testing nothing else it, it was like a, just the bad plan and now it's just like well gee there's a whole new branch of medicine that uh they're trying to uh, you know get a hold of now a whole new you know, cannabinoid system you know I'm still working with doctors and helping medical marijuana patients here in Oregon and Washington. Good. I'm still helping medical marijuana patients with, with several doctors Good. here. So uh, maybe when you come, you can teaching other doctors about the endocannabinoid system with uh, uh, accredited classes for, you know, doctors need continuing medical education. So... Uh, if they take these classes on the endocannabinoid system, they can get a few credits towards that. Really? And yeah. They're, and they're, okay, and they're viable credits that will be accepted yeah. by state institutions? Exactly. Excellent. We it need is. more of that. The, more of that because one of the biggest, you, as you know as well as me, is this, this education, especially among doctors, is very, very low. And then there's no, like, like a, a, a good course program that they could have, you know, and that you could just, like, move around. Would yeah. be great, and then uh, that. Online. So, if doctors want to take it anywhere in the world, and it's accredited by the three major 
uh, doctor and RN accreditation groups for, for doctors. So if any medical professionals out there need to learn more about the endocannabinoid system, give us a call here at THC wow. Medical Clinic. We'll be happy to help you get in. Good deal. So, Good deal. And then, uh, two, there's not enough research done. Research. That's what's holding back a lot of investment and stuff. Well, that and the fact that, you know, well, you can only invest out of Canada. But it, it's really holding back. And th those two things will, like, change. I think on April 20th of this year, we'll see the United States Senate introduce their legalization bill. You know, the majority leader of the Senate, Schumer, Oregon's own Ron Wyden, and New Jersey's Cory Booker have said they're coming out with a, a marijuana bill soon. And I just have a sneaking feeling that on Wednesday, April 20th, they'll bring it out. But you know, <laughs> the House of Representatives just passed their legalization bill put forward by the head of the uh, Judiciary Committee in the United States House, Jared Nadler. And so uh, that one's already passed the House for the second time. So if the Senate passes one that's a little bit different, then they have to go into compromise between the two. But I fully expect by the end of the year, especially because the Democrats want to reap the political advantages by the November election, that uh, I, I, marijuana will be legal federally here in the United States. No shit. Yeah, I think so. Wow. That's a, that's a big thing, you know. It's, I, it's not that far away, but, uh, you know, the funny thing is when it happens, it's just such a surprise. It is. You know? <laughs> we'll live to see it. So many of our friends didn't. So, hmm. Jorge, we've had Jorge Cervantes on as our guest. I want to thank you again. I know you find out more about your books and your work. Is it still MarijuanaGrowing.com? Yeah, marijuanagrowing.com. Uh, actually, right now, go there. You can sign up for uh, sign up to get all the information about the book. The marijuanagrowing.com and it's marijuana with a J, not an H or a G. It's with a J, like the spell in America. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, when does your new book come out? Uh, we're. I'm hoping to have everything online by by July. Uh, next, we're, we're going to continue to put stuff up. I'm starting a blog. Uh, that information, it's just, uh, we got to build a structure so so good and have everything in place before, um, yeah, uh, so everything will load fast because I got a real smart web guy and he says make uh, the proper architecture. So uh, I'm hoping to have everything out by July. Okay. Uh, and, but going. watching because there will always be things happening. MarijuanaGrowing.com. Go out there and check it out. Thank you, Jorge. I, I hope to see you when you come here or somewhere out there on the cannabis trail. Keep on working at it and help restore hemp. <laughs> <laughs> venga, venga. Estoy listo. <laughs>